lectureship honors Carol for her outstanding service through years of de devoted commitment to the Jefferson County Department of Health, as well as many other community and statewide organizations interested in providing quality health care. In all her professional and community activities, Carol led with diligence and innovation while always placing the public first. This leadership was, this lectureship was created to honor her passion for excellence as well as to continue her tradition of intellectual innovation and community involvement. Indeed, Carol was that rare community leader whose heart and soul were bound to their life's work to guarantee that for others, life will be filled with possibilities and opportunities. Her untimely death several years ago saddens all of us who knew Carol and so often followed her lead toward efforts to improve the health and well-being of everyone in our community, most especially the disenfranchised and marginalized. Her legacy of her work in many areas of public health and this endowed lecture give life and voice to her vision and hopes for a better place for people to live, work, and play. <clears throat> I'd like to give a very special thanks to Paul Samuelson, her husband, for being here. Appreciate all your support. And also for members of the Broad Street Committee, which is the school's advisory board, Cameron Vowell. Who else is Joyce in the back. Joyce, I mean Joy, and I saw somebody else. Anyway, thank you all for being here. And also, uh, Dr. Corey Armstrong. Where's Corey? Corey is chair of the Department of Communication and Media creative media, journalism creative media at the University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa. Um, she came up here with her, some of her faculty and students and we're just delighted that they could join us uh, today for this. So it's now my pleasure to introduce um, this year's speaker, Mr. Noam Levy. Um, we've had a great time uh, with Noam Beam here. He actually has um, pretty deep roots to Alabama. Um, he uh, is, as you may know, is a um, very sought after um, journalist who uh, speaks a lot, writes a lot, uh, actually has a book uh, forthcoming or is in the works about health innovation and healthcare. But his internship uh, for journalism was with the Montgomery Advertiser uh, in Montgomery several years ago. And he would come to Birmingham because of the cultural attractions we were kind of missing in Montgomery. <laughs> he would come to Birmingham to, to have a good time. Uh, his roommate actually uh, still lives here, and so it's been a really small world for him to, to come back um, to be with us. Uh, we've had a great time uh, since uh, Noam got here, some wonderful conversations about the ACA, about what's going on in D.C. Um, as I've said to many people so far, you kind of walk away with hope, despair, hope, despair, and I hope that you can help us kind of begin to blend and see some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, his title for um, the lecture is Peace in Our Time, Is There an End to the Obamacare Wars? Uh, that was a, a title that he gave us a couple weeks ago. I don't even know if that's the title anymore because <laughs> things keep changing, but we're delighted to have you here. Noam, welcome to Birmingham and to UAB. Thank you. Thank you. I spent a summer in Montgomery uh, where I lived at the uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald Museum, I'm pleased to say, for the summer. Um, but the last time I was actually had spent any time in Birmingham, uh, was when my college roommate uh, was married uh, about, wow, oh, it's almost 20 years ago now. And uh, at the time, uh, there was a tradition among my group of roommates from college, there were 10 of us, that any marriage celebration weekend had to be capped by some naked escapade. <laughs> <laughs> and in Birmingham, that involved leaving the wedding party at the end of the evening and going to the fountain out in front of the Jefferson County Courthouse. <laughs> Being 20-something years old at the time, we didn't give this much thought. But thankfully, uh, thankfully, A, Birmingham is a relatively warm place. Uh, and secondly, uh, thankfully, my friend James's family is well-connected in town and his older sister <laughs> I completely forgot this. His older sister was uh, able to convince the sheriff's deputies that they didn't need to haul us all off as a result of this <laughs> exhibition. <laughs> so yes, I have a lot of connections to this community. <laughs> um, Max and I have uh, been talking off and on for the last several months since Max asked uh, me to, to give this talk about 
what I was going to talk about, and, and it has evolved, as you might imagine, uh, monthly and now daily, hourly, as this debate has taken these strange and, and, uh, and unexpected uh, turns. Um, but I think, fortuitously, actually, I think we are in actually a, an important moment in this long debate. So I cover healthcare for, for the LA Times out of, out of Washington, and, and I, I don't have any special training in healthcare, uh, I'm afraid. Um, but I have been covering this debate since 2008. So I've sort of lived with this, the crafting, the inception of the ACA, its implementation around the country, the political fighting, and now, of course, this effort to, to repeal it. And, of course, the Republican effort collapsed over the summer, we believed, um, after th essentially three attempts to fulfill this long-standing Republican promise to roll back uh, Obamacare. And now we see sort of the, 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 the first hints at perhaps some way out of this, some bipartisan discussion about what health policy could look like in a less partisan uh, environment. So, so it's a, I think it's a, it, it may be valuable to sort of take stock of kind of where, where this debate is, where, where it's come from, what we can take from, from the events of, of, of the last year. Um, I think, first of all, all of us, no matter how we feel about the Affordable Care Act, no matter whether we think it is something that was long overdue, whether we think it's something that is a troubling overextension of government power, we should be troubled by the process that unfolded this year. Now, I've covered Congress for, I covered Washington for, for, for a decade now, more than a decade, and it's messy. It's a process that is rarely pretty under the best of circumstances. People debate vigorously. They pull all kinds of shenanigans to try to influence the way a piece of legislation will be developed. There are white hats, there are black hats, there are whole industries of lobbyists and political operatives who twist the truth. But this is the messy form of government that we had. I mean, Churchill famously said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. Actually, I think that may be apocryphal, but it's, it's attributed to Churchill frequently. And the thing that distinguished what Congress tried to do this year, I think, was depart very profoundly from this process of governing. And a lot has been made rightfully, I think, of the way that the president has pushed the boundaries of what our governing norms are. His firing of the FBI director, his tweet disputes with foreign dictators and members of Congress, and, and, and his labeling of the media as enemies of the people. I think these are troubling things. But in some ways, again, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, what Congress did was in some ways an even greater transgression of our governing norms. And what do I mean by that? Number one, what Congress was trying to do was big. I mean, this wasn't just changing a small piece of legislation. This was rolling back and replacing a really, really big bill, the, one of the biggest bills that, that we've seen in the last half century in, in Washington. Normally, that would be a process that was pursued through committee hearings, through markups. Now, these are really boring, really boring. And a lot of times, people go to these committee hearings. They hear people drone on and on, giving speeches, et cetera, et cetera. But the value of that process is that it allows for input from various different stakeholders to give their perspective and for lawmakers to balance this. And it slows down the process, giving people an opportunity, giving interest groups, frankly, an opportunity to weigh in. I mean, these interest groups are not some abstraction. These are people who live, in this case, the healthcare system, patients. They're industries, like hospitals, even drug companies who have to live within this system. And in order for the system to work, everyone has to live within it. But they short-circuited this, not once, not twice, but three times. 
There were no congressional hearings about <coughs> this bill to speak of. At one point, we were treated actually to the spectacle of a piece of legislation, this was in the House side, being locked away in a basement room in the Capitol, put off limits to anybody except Republican members of the House. And a police, Capitol policeman stationed outside to prevent people from coming inside and looking at this piece of legislation. Rand Paul, who's a very conservative, as you probably know, very conservative senator from Kentucky, actually led reporters at the Capitol on this wild goose chase around the Capitol to try to find the bill, which was sort of funny, except, except it's kind of not. The final proposal that was floated on Capitol Hill to roll back the Affordable Care Act, something proposed by Senators Lindsey Graham from South Carolina and Bill Cassidy from Louisiana, would have not merely rolled back the core parts of the Affordable Care Act, it would have fundamentally transformed the financing system that the federal government has used for the last 50 years to fund health insurance for tens of millions of poor people, a whole new system of block grants, which had never really been studied. And there was, there was at the last minute, a single hearing about this. I think the other thing that was troubling about this process and how rushed it was and how opaque it was, was a deliberate effort by congressional leaders to undermine the value of independent expertise. Some of you may know there's an office, it's actually in a nondescript government building at the base of Capitol Hill where the Congressional Budget Office operates. It's full of economists and statisticians public policy types who sit around and their job is to look at big pieces of legislation and try to model what the impact will be. What will it do to the deficits? What does it do for federal spending? In, in the case of healthcare, what does it mean for health insurance? What does it mean for how much people pay for health insurance? How many people have health insurance? Congressional Republicans deliberately attempted to circumvent this level of analysis and to devalue it. And so essentially you had a situation in which Congress was prepared to vote on these huge bills without any sense of what impact they would have. That's not a good process. Finally, Republicans pushing this repeal bill ignored the voices of the stakeholders within the healthcare system. The patients, the doctors, the hospitals, the insurers, the nurses the people who are living it and providing it. And this again, as I said, I think this is an important part of our system that these people provide input. I've covered at Washington, as I said, for 10 years. I've never seen an effort to deliberately shut the door in the face of interest groups as explicit as what was been prosecuted, what was prosecuted this year. I mean, it, it got to the point where I would have conversations with people from like the March of Dimes, the American Lung Association, the American Cancer Society, who said they would, they would try to schedule meetings with congressional leaders who were, who were allegedly working on this bill only to be told there was no time to meet with them. And they said, we need to explain to you what it means if you move the, the, the health insurance regulation this way or that, what it means for patients. Sorry, no time. Now this is a major departure not only from the way major pieces of legislation have been developed in the past. Medicare, for example, I think the first Medicare bill was proposed in 1957. Eight years it took of constant negotiation and, and discussion about what that piece of legislation would look like before it was finally signed by President Johnson in 1965. And even the Affordable Care Act, whose process was problematic in, in, in many ways, was a 15-month process. It was rushed at the very end, but I think people forget at the time the extent to which the proposals that were floated out there were subject to a withering series of debates, critiques, analyses. Someone did a tally once of this. There were, in the House, there were 79 hearings over the course of the year. They heard from 181 witnesses. They accepted 121 amendments to that piece of legislation through this congressional process. 
In the Senate, there were more than 100 hearings, roundtables, walkthroughs, and other meetings. The Senate Finance Committee, this is often forgotten, engaged in a nine-month process in 2009, led by the chairman, Max Bacchus of, 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 uh, of Montana, a nine-month process with Republican members of that committee in an effort to get to bipartisan consensus on what a bill ought to look like. Now, that, that process ultimately collapsed for a number of reasons. But that process more closely approximated what we sort of, our governing norms have been. Now, obviously, uh, the effort to repeal Obamacare collapsed. It felt, it, it, or it's in pause, I think we should say. It's, it's, <laughs> it's in abeyance at the moment. Um, it may come back, although I'm, I'm, I think there's an open question about that. But I think we can take a few lessons from, from this. And, and, and I think they're important as we think about kind of where this debate may be going. Number one, I think the experience of the last year showed that legislating like this had a cost. Um, Republicans not only failed, they alienated large swaths of the country. At the end, the, 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 the repeal proposals were pulling below 20 percent, which is hard to do in this country because we're sort of a 50-50 country, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal. Getting that low in approval rating is tough. I think the other thing that became clear was that, um, and this isn't a partisan um, observation so much, I think it's just a reflection of the difference in the parties. Republicans, it turned out, were not ready to tackle health care of this magnitude in a way I think that some of them thought they were. And I think this just reflects the fact that sort of historically, Democrats have loved health care as an issue. They love debating it. They've thought about single payer. They've dreamed about it for decades. They've tried. They've failed. They've, you know, whole institutes and academic departments have been devoted over years to thinking about the lessons that were learned and how policy, health policy could be made differently. So that when they had their chance in 2009, 2010, they had a sort of a rough idea of the compromises that they were going to have to make. They were going to have to placate the, the far left that wanted single-payer health care and settle on something else. And it turned out that Republicans just had not done that process. And they, they didn't have to. I mean, they didn't have to produce a big bill. It's not something that the base of the Republican Party was demanding the way it was on the Democratic side. And so when, when it got to actually making a big piece of legislation, it turned out that there were some fundamental issues on the right that had not been hashed out. Some members of the Republican Party, some conservatives, saw this as an opportunity to achieve what for them was sort of a, a long-standing dream of, of dramatically scaling back government entitlements. The government was spending too much on these health care programs like Medicaid, Medicare. This was an opportunity to, to really draw that back. There was a lot more anxiety on the part of other Republicans and more governors here, but some senators as well, about the potential impact of the level of retrenchment that was being proposed and what this could mean for state budgets, for citizens who would lose health insurance protections. And that tension within the Republican Party is a large reason why, even with the majorities they had in Congress, they couldn't kind of get their bill over the finish line. The other thing that I think really became apparent, and this was something that I, I don't think was really appreciated very well going into the debate, it turned out that Americans valued insurance coverage and these insurance protections more than I think people realized. Republicans went into this debate very successfully, I think, drawing on Americans' deep anxiety and anger and frustration about health care costs. But they hadn't sort of come to terms with the fact that people perhaps did not want to lose some of the protections that the Affordable Care Act and other government programs, for that matter, had extended. And there was some evidence out there. Kaiser Family Foundation, um, over the course of the last seven, eight years, has done very interesting polling nationally about people's views about health care and health policy and so forth. And one of the interesting things which they found was that individual parts of the Affordable Care Act, if they were divorced from Obamacare as a epithet, uh, were actually quite popular. 80% of Americans said they favor Medicaid expansion, 80 percent, 
which is sort of remarkable because, I mean, I think there is sort of a stereotype, this is welfare medicine, this is just like a welfare program, 80%. That's a lot. And if you step back and think about it, this is actually not that surprising. A lot of people in a lot of parts of the country that don't look like Berkeley or Boston rely on these programs. We did a little bit of research over the summer looking at um, counties in the United States where more than 50% of the children are on either Medicaid or CHIP, or the Children's Health Insurance Program. So there are about 3,500 counties in the United States. 700, in 780 counties, more than half the kids are on one of these programs. And it's not Los Angeles or Chicago, primarily. 622 of these counties um, have fewer than 50,000 people. They're mostly rural, and they're mostly overwhelmingly white, and they're mostly in conservative parts of the country, with a few exceptions, like the Mississippi Delta, the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, New Mexico. I went to one of these places in West Virginia over the summer, La, uh, Fayette County, which is an old coal country south of Charleston, um, a little town called Montgomery, Montgomery, West Virginia. Um, you know, most of the jobs have left this place. Uh, there was a university there that's closing. The high school closed. Even the coal-fired power plant down the river closed. There's still coal, but there's not many jobs in coal. There's one pediatrician left in town um, who grew up there. She practices on the first floor of the local community hospital there, which is also about to close. There's like three restaurants. One of them's a pizza place. I mean, it's pretty bleak, pretty bleak community. Like something like 60 to 70 percent of her patients, kids, are on Medicaid or CHIP. And some of this, frankly, is opioid driven. There are a lot of these kids who are being raised by grandparents, a frightening number. But there's also a lot of, a lot of kids there who are from working families. I mean, I met, met one uh, patient, uh, one family there, Nikki Given was her name. She worked at a local daycare. Her husband was getting a job at a local sawmill. They had a one-year-old kid who had persistent ear infections and ultimately needed some procedures. I mean, these people were not on the dole. Their daycares don't offer health and benefits usually. And a lot of the even sawmill type jobs don't offer health benefits anymore either. This is all there is in a lot of these communities, are these programs. And it's in red states. Arkansas, something like all but three or four counties in Arkansas, more than half the kids are on, are on Medicaid. West Virginia. Now, one of the interesting things that happened during the debate was that this value of this coverage, I think, came to be appreciated by a lot more Americans. By the end of the debate, interestingly, so the Pew uh, Foundation does, also does a lot of interesting polling about people's views about the value of government. And they found by the end of the debate that 60% of Americans thought it was a core responsibility of the federal government to provide health insurance. 60%, which had the highest number that they had recorded in more than a decade. So if anything, this debate sort of focused on that, on that issue. There's uh, some researchers at the University of Minnesota who there's some political science health policy folks and they've sort of looked at this phenomenon and they define this as the, 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 the vital center of American public opinion about healthcare. That is to say, people want to control costs, but they don't necessarily want to do it at the expense of taking away health protections. Now the problem, of course, going forward is that getting at that vital center is very difficult when we're having the, current, the kind of conversation about healthcare that we're having right now. The conversation we're having right now is essentially a conversation about grievance, I would say. It's being driven by people's, some people's deep and in many cases well-founded frustration about how much they're being asked to pay for health insurance particularly people who don't get government, don't, are not on a government health plan, like Medicare or Medicaid, or people who are getting coverage through an employer. And these people 
many of whom were able to buy health insurance before the Affordable Care Act, have seen truly eye-popping increases in their premiums. I mean, so going from, I, I, I did a story a, a, a few months ago about a guy named Jim Hansen. He was a retired um, ele uh, electrical engineer in Denver. He and his wife decided that they had saved enough money he could retire early, and they calculated how much they were going to have to pay for their health insurance between the time that he retired and he got to Medicare eligibility. He thought that he could budget about $100,000 for this 10-year period. And they did okay. They obviously had a big enough nest egg to do this. They didn't have kids. Um, when they start, when they start, when they retired uh, five years ago, they were paying $5,000 uh, a month for health insurance. Next year, their premium is going to be $17,685. I mean, he's pissed. And I mean, who can blame him, right? He also feels, as many people do, that something's not right, that something's not fair. And I think this gets at the big challenge right now. This feeling that I'm being asked to do something. I'm being asked to pay $18,000 a year. And my neighbor down the street is getting free health care. Something's not right about that. It seems unfair. And this, this feeling of grievance, this feeling of, 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 of unfairness, I would argue has been very successfully exploited. Because it's advanced an argument that's essentially pitted one American against another. This idea that in order for you to get something, I have to suffer. And that's been manifested at very clearly, actually, in the legislation that's been debated this year. Some of these proposals to roll back requirements on health insurers, on what they have to cover, have been sold as a way to make health insurance cheaper, right? And, and makes sense. The Affordable Care Act requires that health plans cover maternity coverage. It requires that they cover mental health and substance abuse services. It requires that they cover prescription drugs. All those make health insurance more expensive. If I could get a plan, you know, I don't, I don't have a heroin problem. I don't need substance abuse coverage, I don't think. Maybe I could get a plan that doesn't cover that. But you know what that means? If I get it cheaper, then someone who does need those services is going to have to pay more. The last proposal to change the Affordable Care Act, the Graham-Cassidy proposal, took this divisiveness to an even greater level by, by, by changing this formula that I talked about, about the way the federal government provides hundreds of billions of dollars of federal money. They explicitly said some states are getting too much money, other states need to get more. <laughs> Take money from California and New York and Massachusetts, give it to Texas. It pit one state against another state. So we have this health policy discussion that's basically pitting one group of Americans against another. Now, the good news, I think, is that it, it doesn't have to be this way. Why do I believe this? Well, first of all, I know, as a patient and as someone who writes about healthcare, spends a lot of time talking to patients, that we all have the same desire for our health care system. Whether we're Republican or Democrat, whether we live in Alabama or Massachusetts, right? we have certain expectations about what we want our medical system to, to, to look like. We, when we go to the doctor, we want our doctor to look us in the eye, to listen to what we have to say, to put his or her hand on our abdomen or wherever it may be, and feel for what is hurting us. I mean, these are not partisan expectations of the healthcare system. We have more prosaic things that we want. We want to be able to get an appointment when we, when, we, when we need one. When we get to the doctor, we don't want to be made to wait for an hour and then treat it as if we are an inconvenience to the medical office or the hospital. We don't want to have surprise medical bills. We don't want to get sent off for tests that we don't need. All these things, these are not these, these, these are common expectations. 
The other thing is that, the other piece of good news here, I think, is that some healthcare systems, some places, have figured out a way to do those things. This is not like a utopian fantasy that, oh, that if you could only get to this nirvana, you could find this. There are places around this country that are doing it. And you can see it when you walk into a doctor's office in the way that patients act, in the way that clinicians talk to each other, just in the way that a doctor and a nurse have a conversation. You can tell about whether that, that system is working. You can, the best designed medical clinics in this country, I've visited them, don't really even have waiting rooms. They track how long people are there. They've made it a priority that people can get in to see the doctor immediately. And they spend a particularly uh, 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 important part of their job looking after the most expensive and the sickest people because they know that is where you really get at the issue of making the health system work better. And you know, the funny thing is when you, when you go to these places and you see them, and you see patients in them, it's, it's funny because I don't think most of us have the expectation of the healthcare system that it will do these things. We've been like so beaten down by the healthcare system that we've just accepted a bunch of this stuff. But when you see patients in these kinds of systems that work around the country, it's like they've had a moment of revelation. Oh, this is what it's like. You mean like a nurse is going to help me when I need to um, get my diabetic uh, eye exam? You mean I'm not just going to be sent off to a specialist and they're going to forget about me and then I'm going to get prescribed a bunch of drugs that I don't understand and then when I show up at the hospital, they're going to have no idea who I am and they're going to wonder why I have 12 pill boxes in my handbag? Like, people realize, wow, it doesn't have to be this way. The last reason, and, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop here, the last reason why I believe that we can have a different conversation uh, about healthcare is that rather than dividing the country, there is actually ample evidence that healthcare can be something that brings the country together. Now, we celebrated a couple of years ago the 50th anniversary uh, of Medicare. 1965, LBJ signed the Social Security Amendments that created Medicare. He traveled to Independence, Missouri, and he signed, uh, signed the legislation at the Truman Library there. And there was a lot of reflection at the time about kind of all the things that Medicare has wrought. One part of that story which didn't get as much attention as I think it deserved, and maybe some of you know this story already, is um, the intersection of Medicare and the Civil Rights Movement. It's an interesting thing because when Johnson signed the law, of course, this was the height of the Civil Rights era. Schools, communities were being racked by the desegregation debate of schools, lunch counters, etc. And Johnson, it turns out, was terrified that his, one of his crown legislative achievements, Medicare, was going to be destroyed by a really divisive racial debate, particularly in this part of the country. Because, of course, hospitals across the country were segregated. Go to Atlanta, there's a reason there are two towers at Grady Hospital in Atlanta, the big safety net hospital there. There were black hospitals and white hospitals. And federal law prohibited federal expenditure on segregated institutions. And so between the summer of 1965 and the summer of 1966, when Medicare was going to go live, the Johnson administration slowly actually awoke to the reality that they were going to have to deal with this problem. And they were going to have to travel around the country and get institutions to desegregate. And so, you know, at the time, HEW, the Health Education Welfare Department, gathered volunteers from across the federal government who joined these teams who drove around the country visiting every little hospital to get them to sign a, um, an attestation that, that, that come, I think it was July 1st, 1966, they would be desegregated. There wouldn't be separate maternity wards, et cetera, et cetera. And um, as the hour approached, 
midnight or whatever it was on July. They, they got almost every single hospital in the country to abide by this uh, desegregation agreement, but to make sure they actually had made uh, uh, contingency plans at VA hospitals across the country to be ready to take Medicare patients if they showed up at a hospital that was not, that had not been cleared. It didn't get a lot of attention, but basically overnight, and this story I, I commend to you, David Barton Smith, who's a, who's a, a historian who wrote, who's written, written this up in a number of different uh, publications. It's an amazing story. Um, overnight, essentially, the healthcare system was, not the whole healthcare system, the hospital system in this country was desegregated, and there was none of the, without the kind of fighting over schools that we saw. Now, was there racial harmony all of a sudden? Were there disparities eliminated? No, of course not. It took a long time, and many of the disparities within the healthcare system persist. But I think it showed profoundly that healthcare can be something that, that advances a cause of unity rather than divides. And I'll tell you, I'll finish with this one, one little, little story for you. I spent a fair amount of time over the past couple of years for a project I've been working on on and off about healthcare in Arkansas, in the Arkansas Delta, which is the part of the, you know, the, the Mississippi Delta on the Arkansas side, very poor part of America. And West Memphis is a, as it would indicate, is right across the river from Memphis, pretty, pretty depressed part of the country, not a lot going on in West Memphis, kind of like Montgomery. Um, and, but it does have a new federally qualified health clinic. And as some of you may know, FQHCs have undergone something of a renaissance in the last decade. In part because first the Bush administration and then the Obama administration put a lot of money into funding these clinics for providing uh, medical care in, in, in to, to poor patients. And as a result of all this money and this investment, FQHCs, which in many cases had sort of operated out of storefronts and in ramshackle homes, uh, moved into these beautiful new clinical spaces. These, they're oftentimes the nicest building in town. You know, they have sort of big skylights, these sort of beautifully um, designed uh, uh, team spaces and exam rooms and so forth. And the one in West, West, West Memphis was, had, had moved, and I was talking to the, the doctors there a little bit about what that move had meant. And, um, you know, had it had made life easier, and of course, you know, it's easier to get, the, get, to get the care, it's easier to work together, the technology's better, et cetera, et cetera. But the most profound thing they said was that patient's behavior has changed. So people are coming to the doctor more often. Now, if you're caring for a community like they do in West Memphis, getting many of whom have chronic diseases, you want people coming in if they have diabetes or COPD or high blood pressure, because you want them to manage that disease. And one of the biggest challenges that clinicians who work with those populations has had is that it's very difficult to get people engaged in their own medical care. They're seeing that. In fact, they've noticed that people, the patients, are dressing differently. They're like dressing better to come to the doctor because people have a greater sense of belonging and self-worth going to a place that conveys a message that A, we care, and B, you're part of a system that means something. So I don't know if we're there yet to have this conversation that I'm talking about as a country. But I do know that people in Washington are, 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 are tired, or people are getting tired. There are legislators on the Republican side as well who are tired of fighting over this. I mean, no small part because they haven't really won anything, but in part because a lot of the people who go to Washington actually want to accomplish things. They actually want to legislate. And we saw a little bit of this over the last couple of months in the Senate Health Committee where Lamar Alexander, the Republican from uh, uh, Tennessee who chairs the committee, Patty Murray, the Democrat from Washington, have been working on a very small bill to just try to help stabilize insurance markets around the country. And interestingly, there were uh, four hearings that this committee held last month to take testimony from governors, insurance commissioners, folks around the healthcare system about how to do this. And there was like this catharsis 
among the members of this committee who were effusive in their thanks to the chairman of the committee. Thank you for holding these hearings. It's so nice to have a conversation about how we can actually address some root issues that are of great concern to our constituents rising premiums. So I think there is an urge there to do some of this stuff. Whether we'll get there, I'm not sure. I, I, I titled my talk, uh, uh, A Peace in Our Time, which was a play some of you may know on Neville Chamberlain, who was the British Prime Minister before the Second World War. After he returned from his meeting with Hitler uh, in 1938 uh, in Munich, he famously came back and he said, I've achieved peace in our, peace for our time was actually the line, peace for our time. And of course, a year later, you know, the world blew up. So uh, I, I want to put that out there as a caution against overly optimistic thinking. Um, but I think, I think, as I said, that there are a lot of reasons why we can do this differently. And at the end of the day, if we don't, if the country can't have a different conversation about health care, the alternative is almost too horrible to think about. It means rationing. It means that people can't go to the doctor. It means higher costs. It means more suffering. That's the alternative. And I don't think that's the healthcare discussion we want to have.